So it's that sort of action that then, four or five or six years later, translates into, much, into higher bills for all, but ultimately a much more reliable system out there. So when we talk about what customers are interested in, again, I can ask questions of everyone in the room here. You know, if these are different than what your needs are, um, I'd like to hear about them. Because I think at the end of the day, it's, it's very similar one customer to the next. When we talk about, you know, global warming or reducing the carbon footprint, we also need to understand in certain environments, different messages play better than others. You know, there's a lot of interest in global warming and carbon reduction for the, the, for the, the uh, need to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases. Whether that's true or not is really diff different where, where you are. You know, in certain rural areas, folks don't buy into the global warming. But they do buy into reducing the dependence on foreign oil. Making sure their sons and daughters who are going to the Mideast aren't fighting both sides of the war. Right, so there's different messages that we all need to use internally because these pr types of manage managing energy cost money. Um, and getting the buy-in from other internal parties is always key. There's a lot of competition for money within every facility. And typically, if you're going to put out money or, you get, or if, if an energy project is competing with something else that will improve your process or make something more productive or expansion of your business, Typically, it takes a back seat. So what we're also working to help our customers understand is how we can manage and help them internally once they understand what they should do and move forward to, to save or manage their energy. And I talk a lot about managing their energy, and it's very, very appropriate we're here with Enernoc because having uh, dealt with Enernoc for six or seven or eight years myself uh, and knowing what they do, they really get the, the, the issue of managing energy. It's not always about having to save energy. A lot of times it's when you use it and how much you use it and how you can manage in your own internal needs so that you can manage it effectively. So as we move forward here, there are a lot of options out there. The standard efficiency options are still there and will always be there. You know, we, we have to remember, even if you've done some projects in the, in, in the recent past, we keep, continue to get more and more efficient with systems, with variable frequency drives, with lighting systems, lighting design. The big issue now is that instead of just replacing lighting lamp for lamp, you'll actually redesign the, 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 uh, the, how the, how the uh, lighting system is set up there. Now, it costs a little bit more, but at the end of the day, you will save more money with that because you'll be putting the light where it's actually needed, not just using the same layout that may have been in some of these rooms and and uh, facilities for 10 or 20 or 30 years. So when you're really deep, talking about the deeper energy savings that we're all striving for, that's what you really look to do. It isn't simply replacing this motor with that motor, it's thinking hard and long, what can I do that will get more savings instead of simply replacing it like for like? And that involves a lot of different pieces of the pie. The primary thing is what the base equipment is, but the other issues are things like pricing options. It's a, it's a known fact if you can take a real-time price, and we've done this analysis work with the ISO New England the last few years, we're actually actively working on a real-time pricing option, working through the ISO New England for our customers. Because we know from the numbers we've run that you'll save 10 to 20 to 30 percent on your annual energy bill if you can take a real-time price. Now, naturally, there's times of the year you'll pay a lot more than you would, but this year is a perfect example. This is one of the hottest summers we've had since 2006. Our system peaks were, uh, were back in 2006, and New England uh, peaked around 28,000 megawatts. This year, it's only 26,000. Even with the heat, with the economy, unfortunately, I think that's, that's really caused a lot of latent load that we saw in 2006 not to, not to be there. But even with that, Prices didn't go up very high. And when they went up to 22 cents a kilowatt hour, it was only for a few hours a year. When you balance that off with all the other hours that were trading at three and four cents, you can see that the real time price can save lots of money. Now, what that prompts you to do then is to manage that load. And how do you manage it most effectively? Most folks are very reluctant to allow anyone else to control their load, which makes perfect sense. They've got a system, they've got to get product out the door, they've got to make sure they're the workers are comfortable, so they, 
So they'll stay in the office and not wander around uh, looking for other things to do. So when you talk about managing, a, giving the customers like you choice to manage what you're doing, I think that's the key piece. So a combined effort of efficiency and automated load management based on your own parameters is really what we're driving customers to try to get to. And companies like Enernoc are very solid partners with that with us to help that because ultimately when we talked about the bill, we talked about the commodity piece, the six or seven cents, the delivery piece, the three or four cents. The, we've become a very peaky load society over the last 20 years. If you look and see, today we have 40% of our generation, transmission, and distribution in place for two or 300 hours of the year. If we could reduce that amount of generation we needed for those few, for those few hundred hours to 10 or 20%, the commodity savings would be in the tens of billions of dollars. So when we talk about managing load, it's managing load for all parties. Because the more we manage the load, whether it's from a commercial customer or, or a residential, through some of the smart grid work that a lot of utilities are working on, it'll reduce what the future price of commodity should be, barring some sort of crazy geopolitical nightmare that unfortunately likely will occur at some point in the future. So if we can, by managing the load, yes, your cost for delivery may have to rise because of various things that have to be installed on the system, but the commodity, by theory, should drop. Now that is still a good, it's a theory, it's a solid theory, but I think that's where we all need to get to. When we talk about reducing our dependence on foreign sources of energy, we talk about that's one of the key things we can all do, is to, re, is to manage our load so that when the system is at a peaking condition, we can do our part to reduce that peak. We can do our part to save money on the commodity side of the bill, and we can do our part to help make sure that we can reduce those foreign sources. Excuse me one second. Because when we think about all the options customers have, whether it's replacing a chiller plant, going into their energy management system, simply looking at their interval data. Ron Galuli, if you saw his presentation a couple hours ago, shows very clearly we see so many customers when we show them their nighttime use or use when they're not operating. That is hundreds of kilowatts. And they haven't gone around to figure out why they've got such high off-peak loads. Many times it's very basic systems that are either not being manually switched off like they should be because of some change or reduction in workforce, right? Lots of times there's, <clears throat> there was a whole group of people who used to go around and do that. As people streamlined and got more efficient and tightened their belts with the economy and for other reasons, those people went away. So that's where the automation comes in. Not, and that helps not for the peak load condition, but simply reducing your overall use of energy. If you haven't looked at your off-peak usage, that's one of the first things which you need to do. In many cases, it's a, it's a no-cost fix once you identify what's causing it. Ron showed this, uh, the, the chart of the Solomon Pond Mall, actually, up in Northbrook. They reduced their electric bill over $100,000 just because they finally realized and they hunted down what was running all night long when they were closed. Those simple tactics can really reduce costs for all customers, for, for, for the individual customer, but eventually, because it takes the strain off the commodity pricing, can also reflect pricing for all of the customers. So when we look at the different options you all have here, we all know them, but it's a matter of combining them in a way that works best for your own facility. And that's the key factor here, making sure that what you're looking to do is gonna work for you, but in a, in, in, in a comprehensive manner. As we go forward, there are other options. You know, we, I talked a little about combined heat and power. We offer rebates here in Massachusetts for it now, only in the last year. But the key component, we also offer engineering services to make sure it is sized properly. It is thermally leading uh, CHP. You know, with combined heat power, it's got to pass the same sort of cost benefit tests that, that, other, that any other uh, 
energy efficiency program needs, needs to pass. And, be, and in order to get there, you do have to be thermally leading. And you may not think you've got a thermal load, because most people think about see, combining power in the megawatt class, huge machines in the back of their facility. Well, most customers nowadays just don't have that amount of process load. But if you look at a 75 kilowatt machine or a 150 kilowatts system, you may well be able to be a prime candidate for a smaller engine set. Our analysis shows for most customers, their thermal load in this day and age without a lot of process industrial load, they can have a, a combined heat power plant that'll serve a quarter to a third of their peak electrical needs. But it will run virtually base load and always drop your electric bill that much also in being 60 to 65 percent efficient. People hear about CHP being 85 percent efficient and it can be for a few hours a year. When you look at CHP, you've got to look at the annualized efficiency over the whole 8,760 hours in order to make sure it is running more efficiently. We've seen too many projects where at the end of the year, NYSERDA has done a significant amount of um, uh, analysis of a lot of CHP projects they've, they've funded. And the last one I looked at showed the average efficiency of their projects was in the low 40%, which is pretty poor compared to grid power and compared to what a 92% or higher condensing furnace can give you for your, for your hot water needs. So you really need to understand that, figure out how it fits in with your other needs out there. And make sure when you look at those types of options that the thermal efficiency work, the basic stuff you can do on that side of the house, has been done prior to installing the CHP. Because if you don't do it prior to it, you install the CHP, it runs fine, and then you do thermal efficiency. Now your CHP project, its overall efficiency drops off because you don't have the thermal load for it anymore. That's what